So hi, I'm Rahul, and today I will be talking about Morty. Uh, okay, but first an introduction. So Morty is a storage system utilizing transaction re-execution to increase throughput of serializable and interactive transactions. Serializability gives the illusion of sequential execution, thereby helping developers to reason about application code. On the other hand, interactive transactions allow mixing application code and transaction code, allowing developers to freely express their code. So Morty's draws comparison with other systems based on their choice of concurrency control. Concurrency control can be broadly categorized into two categories, two camps, optimistic concurrency control and pessimistic concurrency control. An example of pessimistic concurrency control will be Spanner. So let's go a little deeper into the idea of these two types of systems as they will be used for comparison later by the paper. First, optimistic concurrency control. As shown in the figure, there are three phases of the transaction, the read phase, validation phase, and the write phase. The first phase of the protocol is the read phase. It's a concurrent phase where multiple transactions are executing in parallel. Here we record the version of each data item that we are trying to read or write. This version will be later used during the validation phase. The second phase is the validation phase and it is executed serially. Here, we are trying to verify that the data items we read have the same version as that of the read time. If any of the data items have a differing version, that means some other transaction has modified it in the meanwhile and the current transaction must abort. The last phase is the write phase where we write the data back with the newer versions. It is also a serial globally critical, global critical section. Optimistic concurrency control is more preferred for workloads where we generally expect less contention. It suffers from high abort rates under contention. So as we can see from the previous description, all the transactions read phase can go in parallel. That means that can, they can read stale data and validation phase is the only phase where we get the global lock and double check that, that the reads and write have not been modified. So it can suffer from high aborts if the same item is being modified by a lot of other transactions. On the other hand, we have pessimistic concurrency control. It utilizes locking schemes to prevent transactions reading or writing each other's data. Two-phase locking is one such method. It is divided into two phases. The first phase is called the growing phase. In this phase, locks are required, but it is not allowed to release any lock in this phase. Growing phase is followed by a shrinking phase where locks are released. In this phase, we are not allowed to acquire any new locks. Pessimistic concurrency control, as you can imagine, is essentially guarding your data and scheduling lock acquisition and release. Therefore, it needs method to prevent or resolve deadlocks as transactions can be asking locks on items in not an order fashion. As I mentioned from the previous slide, it suffers from deadlocks and lock threshing under contention. This can lead to higher abort rates and higher latencies. If the transaction being is being aborted, you have to retry and retry until it's successful. So you can imagine a transaction being successful takes a longer time. Now we have an existential question. How do we make progress in such situations? Usually retrying the transaction with exponential back off has been preferred traditionally. In a deeper sense, retrying a transaction means that we are trying to guess how to space transactions appropriately so they don't conflict. If we are very conservative in our guess for retrying, that means we have a higher chance of the transaction that is being, re uh, being retried to step on an ongoing transaction that it already conflicts with. 
And if we are very liberal with our guests, then we encounter higher latencies because we have a wider gap between two conflicting transactions that could have executed much earlier. So Morty introduces a concept of a serialization window. Transactions reading and writing objects create a serialization windows. In this paper, we talk about serialization windows of data objects. So for example, imagine a transactions having to operate on data items like A, B, and C. The serialization window talks about only particular data item of a transaction. It starts at the right of X. X is the data item we are talking about for a transaction whose value is being observed and ends when the transaction's right becomes visible. So you can imagine if a transaction is trying to operate on a data item X, it can read it, modify it multiple times. So the serialization window starts when the value of X is observed and ends when it is finally written and it's no more read after, written after that. So that's right. So let's understand this with the help of an example. Here we can see transaction one operating on two data objects, A and B. It will involve reading the previous value of A and then updating it. So you can imagine this red box showcasing the serialization window of A where the A's value was read and written multiple times finally and the last write marks the end of the window. This figure talks about conflicting serialization windows. Here we have two transactions, transaction one operating on A and B and transaction two operating on A and C. Here we can see that these transactions has conflicting serialization windows as both are trying to operate on A, right? So if we imagine both these transactions and there's a timeline below, both of them are executing at the same time, Sam. So in a traditional setting, one of the two transactions have to be aborted. Let's come back to Morty's idea. The main idea of the paper is to avoid conflicting serialization windows by rearranging transactions. So whenever such a rearrangement takes place, some parts of the transaction that is being rearranged need to be executed. We'll come back to the point why it needs to be re-executed, not restarted. During re-execution, Morty knows what needs to be re-executed rather than blindly restarting the transaction. And their claim is that re-execution is better than restarting a transaction. So let's go through this one more time with one example. Imagine that there are two transactions, T1 and T2 of the previous figure, where the serialization windows were conflicting. We can resolve the overlap by moving T2 after T1. And that means we have to change the read set of T2 using the write set of T1. So digging a little deeper, First of all, both the transactions were conflicting because they were operating on the same data. So Morty's idea is that we can schedule the second transaction or, or, the, or one transaction after the other. And the transaction that is being rearranged after the one will read the value of the data items from its own on read and write sets. So imagine T2 being moved after T1. So T2 will read all the write set data of T1. Essentially, the order becomes T1 to T2. And this is, a, this is the same thing that, that we do when we try to restart transactions, right? Because whenever we detect a conflict, we abort one and retry it. Essentially trying to say that the other transaction which is aborted needs to be executed after, right? Let's go through one more example. And this example is from the paper itself. Here we have three transactions, T1, T2, and T3. And T1 is operating on X0 data and X1. T2 is operating on X0, X1, and X2. 
and T3 is operating on X0, X1, and X3. Since T1, T2, and T3 all conflict on X0, we need to rearrange T1 and T2, T3. We need to rearrange T2 and T3 after T1, right? So it is not required that we only rearrange T2 and T3. The order, there is a separate algorithm which determines the order, but you can imagine that we, in this example, we are trying to avoid the conflicting windows and we chose T2 and T3 to be rearranged. And on the same lines, since T2 and T3 conflict on X2 as well, right? Because there's a right of X2, we need to rearrange T3 after T2. In this way, all the serialization windows conflict that, the, that these three transactions encounter have been resolved. So now let's talk a little bit about re-execution implementation. What does it entail and how we are implementing it? As Morty supports interactive transactions, we are trying to re-execute. We need to take care of re-executing the application code as well. Morty calls it a read unrolling. So whenever a transaction re-execution takes place, we move a transaction forward in time by inv invalidating the read set. So for example, when T2 was moved forward in time after T1, that means the read set of T2 was invalidated and now have to read some values from T1. But as these are interactive transactions, there might be some application code that already has been executed. So if we're trying to re-execute a transaction by invalidating its read set, that means some application side logic also has to be undone and has to be re-executed. To support this, Morty utilizes the continuation-based APIs. Here, the control flow is specified using function calls. Whenever a transaction starts a re-execution, Morty knows where to restart the transaction and what to re-execute. Let's move on to the transaction execution. Morty uses multi-version timestamp ordering. These timestamps determine the transaction's position in the final total order. Morty also integrates concurrency control with replication. Another way to look at it is generalized Paxos or ETH Paxos. So the commit protocol takes three calls. We have prepare phase, the decide phase, and the finalize phase. Transaction requires a couple of constructs. A transaction begins with a begin statement. Here, the coordinator, which can be any replica, starts a transaction by assigning a unique version ID, which is a tuple of timestamp and ID. ID is the coordinator's ID, and timestamp is the local clock. These local clocks are not synchronized. So, a particular coordinator has a monotonically increasing clock and its own ID. And the timestamps of each coordinator can be, uh, can be forward or backward, does not depend. Here version defines the expected position in the total order of transactions. So you can imagine that timestamp and ID, if, if coordinator ID is unique, then we can say that we can order all the transactions using this tuple and they will be totally ordered. Another construct needed is the get where the transaction tries to read a particular key and value. To accomplish this, coordinator sends the get and the get function get requires a version and a key to a nearby replica. It is not contacting a quorum, it is just contacting the most nearby replica. And the replica tries to reply with a key value with the largest version smaller than the version. So imagine I'm asking a replica, give me the value of the key with version five. It will try to read four or three, whichever is the largest, smaller than the provided version. On the same lines we have put, so coordinator, if it's asked during the transaction to write the 
key value. Coordinator adds the key value to the right set. And it also broadcasts the put version, put key value and version to all the replicas. Now here comes the tricky part. Before replying the replica, all of them check for read misses. A read miss would have happened if replica has already replied to a version which was not seen by the coordinator, right? So in those cases, the replica replies to the coordinator of the missing read that it missed to fix things, essentially triggering re-execution. Get reply is the reply is one of the responses of the put calls where the replicas are checking if the if there were any read misses by the coordinator. And get reply triggers the re-execution of a transaction. As multi integrates concurrency control with replication, commit protocol requires up to three phases. The prepare phase, coordinate requ coordinator requests that all the replicas vote on whether or not the transaction execution is serializable. A replica does it by checking if there were any read misses or there were any writes the coordinator did not see. If all the replicas agree, then the decision is durable and we can proceed to the design phase. Otherwise, finalized phase is required to make a decision durable. Traditionally, a commit protocol has two outcomes, either commit the transaction or abort the transaction. Since Morty can re-execute transactions, therefore a transaction can have multiple executions. And if a transaction can have multiple executions, that means Morty's outcome is not commit or abort, but instead it's commit or abandon. So imagine if a transaction has been re-executed five times. In Morty, the transaction will be allowed to commit if any one, if at least one of the execution is successful, right? Because we retried or re-executed the transaction multiple times and we are looking for that one execution which is successful, then which, which we can commit or abort. And imagine there's a hard limit of like 10 re-executions or, or 20 re-executions. If all the executions are abandoned, then Morty is finally able to say, okay, we can abort this transaction. We cannot go forward with it, right? So instead of the traditional commit and abort, Morty has commit or abandon. And abandon is particular to a transaction execution, where in Morty, a transaction can have multiple executions. Morty's evaluation. Morty specifically in this paper talks about three systems, Tapper, Spanner, and Morty itself. Tapper is the optimistic concurrency control system. Spanner is the pessimistic concurrency control implementation. And during their evaluation, they did not use the Spanner version, which is available in the cloud. So they implemented their own version using some kind of simulation, and that's how they were running the whole evaluation. There are three set setups for running the evaluation. We need, there are three kinds of setups. Regional, there is one continental and one is global. So regional means the replicas are, avail are located in different availability zones of the same region. And continental means replicas are located in different regions, but within the continent. And global means replicas are in US and Europe. To simulate the latencies or the RTTs between different data centers and different machines and different availability zone, they first calculated the simulation, number, these latency numbers using AWS by spinning, spinning up machines in different configurations. And then they used the Linux traffic control to put these kind of numbers on the simulation boxes to simulate, okay, this machine is in uh, Europe, this machine is in US or different availability zones. The 
the evaluation graphs are pretty interesting. For in all the three setups, we can easily see that the good put, good put is what they call as the number of transactions committed per second is very high compared to uh, Spanner, Tapper for TPC C workloads. And the same goes for the another kind of workloads called Requis. I am I pronouncing it wrong. Uh, it's a data set pertaining more to social networking kind of workload. In this kind of setup as well, the good put exceeds all the existing systems. Um, during the paper, they also call out that their throughput is 1.7 times to 96 times better than the throughput of the state-of-the-art systems. That's it. Thank you.